Hello, I'm Jan Newharth, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Welcome to First Five Now, a Freedom Forum conversation series that explores topical issues and features current newsmakers who are using the five freedoms of the First Amendment to guide their work. Today, author Kim Todd talks about her new book, Sensational, The Hidden History of America's Girl Stunt Reporters. The book profiles women journalists, including the legendary Nellie Bly, who went undercover in the waning years of the 19th century to write stories that exposed corruption and abuse in America. The individuals profiled in the book redefined what it meant to be a woman and a journalist, and their influence continues to be felt today by those using the First Amendment right of freedom of the press to effect change. This program is brought to you by the Freedom Forum, which fosters First Amendment freedoms for all. Our vision is an America where everyone knows, understands, values, and defends the freedoms of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. And now, please welcome our moderator, John Maynard. Thank you, Jan, and welcome to First Five Now. I'm John Maynard, Senior Director of Programs for the Freedom Forum. As we celebrate Women's History Month this March, what better time to go back in history to tell the stories of daring women who pioneered a new genre of investigative journalism by going undercover to reveal a number of societal ills. At the turn of the 20th century, women from across the country sneaked into textile mills to report on factory conditions, slipped behind the scenes at corrupt adoption agencies, and fainted in the street to test treatment at public hospitals. In short, they were all willing to stretch the limits of a society that held women back to report the truth and make a difference. And more than a century later, journalists continue to use their First Amendment right of freedom of the press to effect change. We are so pleased today to be joined by Kim Todd, author of the new book, Sensational, The Hidden History of America's Girl Stunt Reporters, which profiles these courageous women whose in-depth stories were published in some of the nation's most popular and well-read newspapers, and through their reporting, changed laws, helped launch a labor movement, championed women's rights, and redefined the role of modern journalism. Their story is even more important in the wake of the many racial and justice equalities that are part of the public conversation today and in an era when journalism is under attack. Kim is the award-winning author of Chrysalis, Maria Sibylia Marion, and the Secret of Metamorphosis, and her book, Tinkering with Eden, A Natural History of Exotic Species in America, was a winner of the Penn Jared Fund Award and the Sigurd F. Olson Nature Writing Award. She is a member of the MFA faculty at the University of Minnesota and is a senior fellow with the Environmental Leadership Program. Kim Todd, uh, welcome to First Five Now. Thank you. Good to be here. So first, tell us what inspired you to write this book and, and, and tell the stories of these courageous women. Well, I was reading a lot of 19th century journalism, as one does, I guess. And um, it just struck me that Nellie Bly's 10 Days in a Madhouse was doing something totally different from a lot of the other writers who tended to be very verbose, uh, making a lot of literary references. And she just like jumps right in. She's got this great voice. She's very funny. She's very self-deprecating. She tells her story in scenes. She uses a lot of dialogue. Um, and unlike a lot of the other material, it's completely readable more than 100 years later, right? You're just sucked into the story. You want to know what happens. She creates a lot of tension and suspense. Um, and so I knew about Bly, but what I didn't know was that she had really launched an entire decade of opportunity for female journalists who wanted to do this undercover investigative work. And so I got very interested in the stories of all the women who came after her and what they had done with this opportunity after they would walked through the door that Bly had opened. Um, and I was also really interested because um, Bly specifically and the women who came after her are very specifically um, writing about being in a female body in situations that being in a female body gives them access to, 
right? They could report on factory conditions for women um, because they could disguise themselves as a woman who is looking for a job in a given factory. So that was also really interesting to me. Right. So their gender certainly served as an advantage uh, in their work. It did. It did. And actually, um, for this very interesting 10 year period, some of them were better paid than their male peers because they had this really unique thing to offer. Right. Give us tell us in, in the title of your book is Girl Stunt Reporter. Give us a definition of a girl stunt reporter and how that phrase came to be. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's sort of a, a term that people use looking back on the genre. Certainly at the time, they were called stunt reporters, they were called girl reporters, a lot of times they were called sensation reporters, because the work that they were doing was considered very sensational. Um, but then in the 20th century, people started to talk about the genre of girl stunt reporter really to differentiate it from muckrakers. And one of the arguments from the book is that they're actually doing the same thing, and the girl stunt reporters were doing it first. Um, but we just kind of have this slurry, slangy term to disc the good work that they were doing. Right. Let's go back to Nellie Bly, who you, you, you've already mentioned. But, um, you know, yeah. I, I think she is probably the best known reporter of this time and, and the one that really started it all. But tell us a little bit more about her, how she got her start. And, you know, maybe tell, her, tell, us, tell our audience her biggest kind of scoop and stunts that, that she did. Yeah, so she grew up in small town Western Pennsylvania um, in not a particularly good situation in that her father had died when she was young and she had this very abusive alcoholic stepfather. Um, and as she came to be a teenager, she just really needed to make money. She wanted to go to school for teaching and there was no money for her to go to the college to te for teaching. And one of the area newspapers, the Pittsburgh Dispatch at the time, was having sort of a debate in its columns about um, the women's sphere, you know, where women should be. And she wrote in and she said, you know, look, I just want an opportunity. You know, I, I've tried to get these jobs. I can't get these jobs. So many are closed to women. Um, and the editor of the P Pittsburgh Dispatch saw something in her writing and invited her to come write for them. So she wrote for the Dispatch for a while. Um, and then she was always very ambitious and she had her eye on New York, where a lot of the most exciting journalism was happening, specifically um, at Pledger of the World. And um, she went and got a job there. And her first assignment was to pretend to be insane and go undercover in Blackwell's Insane Asylum for Women. So she did that. She emerged um, with this incredibly popular story that people just couldn't get enough of um, about the horrible abuses that were going on there, um, the ways that the women were treated. Um, it was freezing cold, they gave them rotten food, um, and it was so popular that um, editors realized, um, we also want to have a girl stunt reporter. <laughs> Where can right. I find one? So. Right. And her other famous uh, story, of course, was traveling around the world. I think a lot of people you know, know about her, her trips around the world. Yeah. So yeah. she did. Um, if you're going to let me talk more about Nellie Bly, I definitely can. So um, she did some more undercover work. One of her most famous ones right after going into the asylum was that she pretended to be the wife of a patent medicine manufacturer. And New York was considering a law at the time which would have made these medicine manufacturers publish, her, publish all their ingredients. Um, and she went in and said, like, to this lobbyist and said, I'll give you $2,000 if you can not make this law not pass. And he's like, well, here's the six legislators who we need to bribe. So she published that. Um, and then she became sort of famous enough that she was not doing undercover work anymore. So she went around the world. Um, she raised Elizabeth Bisland and beat the record laid out in the novel um, Around the World in 80 Days. She did some very valuable reporting on the Pullman strike in 1894. She just had a very long and illustrious career. Right. Um, we won't go through all the women that you profiled in this book. Um, they're all incredible stories. And we don't want to go through them because we want people to read your book. Um, but give us some <laughs> other names that you, would, you, want, that you really want our readers and our viewers here to, to, to know about that maybe have been lost to history. 
Yeah, so one of the people that really struck me as I was working on the book um, was a woman named Nell Nelson. And for a lot of stunt reporters, um, a stunt was their first assignment, but Nelson had more experience and she was also a school teacher. Um, and she disguised herself as a woman looking for a job in Chicago factories in 1888 for the Chicago Times. Um, and some of the um, issues that she exposed are really quite modern. Like she exposes what are essentially like level marketing schemes. And she talks a lot about the sexual harassment that the women faced in the work they were doing. Um, and her actual name was, was Helen Kusek. Um, and her work also had real world effects. It spurred a factory act law um, in Illinois. And later when she moved to New York um, to write for Pulitzer's World, she advocated for female factory inspectors and was able to um, get female factory inspectors employed. Um, another woman who was totally fascinating um, was Victoria Earl Matthews. And Matthews was not a stunt reporter. That was really a role that was played by white women for white owned papers at the, news, at the time. Um, but she did investigative reporting during the 1890s. Um, she was born during the Civil War and she was the daughter of an enslaved woman who had escaped to the North. And um, she started as a, some of the women did doing very typical like women's page material about how to make your home nicer. Um, but then in 1895, she visited the South and she wrote about um, these abuses of these fake employment agencies, which would lure black women to the North and say that they were going to offer them jobs and really um, kind of imprison them in debt once they got there. And she not only wrote about that, but she kind of be she became an activist and um, looked for ways to help these women and started a settlement house so they would have a place to stay while they were looking for work. Just a really fascinating figure. Yeah, and, and these, these stories that they, they wrote obviously made um, major impact on, on changing laws and, and whatnot. But what are some of the more impactful investigative stories that you think made the most impact on society that maybe we can even see today, um, you know, 100 years later? Yeah, I mean, they were writing about um, a lot of issues which dealt with the progressive movement. So they were writing about the poor conditions in tenement housing. Um, again, they were writing about these terrible factory conditions. Um, one of them, um, Eva McDonald Valesh, went on to campaign for, you know, the eight hour day. Um, so they were really very tied in with all of the changes that we saw coming out of the progressive era. Right. Tell us a story about the reporter only known as Girl Reporter um, and uh, what lengths she went to report on um, uh, abortion physicians. Uh, give us a little background on her. Yeah, so um, just a year after Nellie Bly went into the asylum, it was really amazing how quickly the door of opportunity opened and that women all over the country were um, started to be journalists. So just a year after Nellie Bly went into the asylum, a writer who is only identified as the girl reporter visited doctors in Chicago claiming to be pregnant and asking for an abortion, which was illegal at the time. Um, and what she discovered was that many, many doctors agreed to perform one or recommend someone else who would do it. Um, and she wrote up the results of her series for the Chicago Times. And though her attitude and the attitude of the Times was like, oh, this is scandalous, like, oh, this is terrible, um, all these abortions shouldn't be happening. She actually wrote about like women's sexuality in this completely frank way. And she talked about the way that she was treated when she went to the doctors, sometimes great, sometimes not so great. She talked about all the different techniques that would be used. She talks about which medicines they prescribed and at which dosage. Um, so really anyone reading the newspaper would both get an education in um, abortion methods of the day. And if you were a woman who was contemplating it, realized that it was incredibly common and, and easy to get. Um, and it was this very, um, I don't know, it really shook Chicago. There was letters to the editor flooding in. There was lots of debates about, about the situation um, and just a highly unusual subject for, for a um, or a newspaper of the day, or, or even maybe now. Right. 
Was she ever identified, this girl reporter? Well, that was one of the mysteries that I took with me into the book. Um, and it's one of the things that I researched over the course of the book to attempt to see if I could figure out who she was at 100 years remove. So. And what can you what can you tell us without revealing too much? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you anything. <laughs> you guys can read the book. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. But right at the time, I'll tell you. Right at the time, I'll tell you that that people did not um, that she just sort of vanished uh, from the scene. But it was clear through my research that other female reporters knew who she was because they talked about the story and they talked about um, some of the things that happened to her afterwards. Good tease, though. Um, uh, there is a, a, I think, the fascinating subtext in the book about the battle between William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, the two the media moguls. Did, how did they kind of, did they fuel the fire a bit in terms of, you know, signing these stunt reporters to their, to their respective publications? Yeah, they completely did. Um, yeah. So William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer were, you know, the media titans of the 1890s, and right. they were locked in a very heated circulation battle. Um, you know, Hearst had worked for Pulitzer briefly and then gone on to use his techniques for the San Francisco Examiner, and then in the mid-1890s bought a paper so that he was really competing with Pulitzer head to head. And, you know, part of the ammunition of their battle was these female journalists because they were so popular. So you had years um, it, like in 1896 where um, the Sunday pages were just filled with reporter after reporter after reporter doing this kind of work um, because it was so popular. And they had really large illustrations of the women doing the work and um, they paid them very well. So. Right. Uh, at the end of the book, you, you connect these um, stunt reporters uh, to the new journalism uh, written by individuals from Truman Capote to Tom Wolfe. Um, can you expand a little bit on that, on that connection that you, that you made in the book? Yeah. One of the things that was almost immediately clear reading Nellie Bly's 10 Days in the Madhouse, in the Madhouse was that she was doing exactly Act Tom Wolfe describes in his um, book about the new journalism. So um, scene-based reporting, using lots of dialogue, this very engaging point of view. Um, and then, you know, Wolfe describes it as status detail, but lots of details about, you know, people's lives and how they're positioning themselves in the world through their possessions and their clothing. Um, and she's really doing all of it. And interestingly, at the time, um, it was also called new journalism. What they were doing in the 1890s um, was also called new journalism, um, but Wolf just kind of rediscovered it and, and repopularized it, but didn't give the nod to um, these earlier progenitors. So I just wanted to make that connection explicit and give them a little credit. Yes, uh, all credit due for sure. Um, how, did, the, did the work of these women eventually fall out of favor um, in the early 20th century or mid, uh, like when, when did it start? So if you know about the Pulitzer Hearst battle and track it, you know, it kind of comes to a head in the Spanish-American War in um, 1898. And after that, um, because people saw the journalism of that reporting around that as so excessive, um, it, it was dubbed like yellow journalism and kind of thrown in the trash and became like what journalism defined itself as against. And because these women reporters were so associated with that kind of journalism, um, their work was also discredited and, and thrown in the trash. Um, mm -hmm. So they got swept up in the larger condemnation of some of the techniques that um, the world and the New York Journal were using. Right. And again, not going through each of these reporters, but did many of them yeah. continue reporting? Did they, did, did they change professions? I mean, one of the things that was so interesting to me was that they really used this open door as different kinds of opportunities. Some of them went on to become novelists. Some of them went on to become magazine and book editors. Some of them continued reporting. Some of them got married and dropped out of public life altogether. Um, 
uh, you know, there was one reporter who was very associated with the world's stunt reporting, um, and her name was Kate Swan, and she actually used her own name and had a hard time finding work after that. Um, a lot of the other women had more opportunities because they had used pseudonyms, and the pseudonym became more famous than their own name. Right. Interesting. Um, you know, today we see so much, so much consequential journalism coming from from women reporters, certainly reporting on the on the Me Too era and, and, and sexual mm -hmm. harassment claims and whatnot. Um, I'm wondering if you have a sense that after the era of the girl stunt reporters, you, you, you sort of just touched on that a little bit. What, were women relegated to more kind of, you know, home and, and cooking type stories in, for a while before it, it, it came back? I just, I'm, I'm trying to get your opinion on that. I think that they definitely were. I, I think there was sort of two paths open to them. One was that they would write about, you know, more women's issues, um, right. which tended to be less respected and less well-paying work. Um, or they would write about um, things that didn't have anything to do with women. So like yeah. if you were a female war correspondent would be, you know, a very, a very respected path through journalism. Um, but, you know, particularly in the early 20th century, you wouldn't be writing about women's lives in particular. Um, so I think that's one of the wonderful things about our current moment is that all these opportunities are opening up um, for women to write about all things at a really high and respected level. Yeah. Um, at the Freedom Forum, you know, our, our mission is to foster First Amendment freedoms for all. And of course, all the work you, you write about is was possible due to the First Amendment um, and the freedom of press. So I'm curious how often you know, did you, you think of that freedom? Uh, what, what role did it play in the book as you were putting this, this book together, that, that, that very important First Amendment right? Yeah, I mean, it, um, I think, infused the spirit of the book. I mean, one was um, sort of three different points. One was Pulitzer, in particular, was really a voice for journalism. He spoke very eloquently about the rules and responsibilities of the press, which he saw as you know a major power in the world. Um, and he really set the tone for newsrooms in that way. Um, so that was one, that's one aspect of it. Um, the other was, you know, the series written by these women attracted a lot of outrage and some libel suits, like the Never Rip Jersey Company sued the Chicago Times and a lot of daughter, doctors um, sued also the Chicago Times over the abortion exposés. Um, and so it was really actually surprising and gratifying to see how much the editors defended their reporters and their reporting, um, you know, right, right on the editorial page um, and in the courtroom. Um, so on the one hand, it was this time of great freedom. On the other hand, you have like the Comstock Act of 1873, which was still in force. And while as we think of the Comstock Act as banning obscene materials, not a lot of people realize that it also banned the selling or possession of information about contraception and abortion. So when you have a story like the girl reporter story for the Chicago Times, like she really is walking a line um, in terms of what people were able to talk about in terms of women's bodies. Um, and one last thing is, mm. you know, yellow journalism has pretty much been accepted as like something bad and that we needed to get past. But it was interesting in my research for this book, how it was a little bit used a cry of fake news. You know, it really was something that competitors used to um, discredit the world and the journal. It got them banned from libraries at some times. Um, and also, you know, like Southern papers would recall call reports of lynchings, you know, yellow journalism. Um, so at times it was used to label things um, just that people were not comfortable with. Right. And finally, Kim, what do you hope people get uh, out, of, out of reading reading your book, Sensational? Well, um, I hope a number of things like one is I just want these women to to get a little bit more credit and I think people um, should learn about their fascinating stories um, you know and there really were negotiating hurdles and sort of making a rich and fulfilling life for those um, despite the fact that they couldn't vote despite the fact that a lot of professions weren't open to them um, and I think that's inspiring for anyone as we all face different hurdles at different times. So.
Well, the book is Sensational, The Hidden History of America's Girl Stunt Reporters. Uh, Kim Todd, thank you for joining us today on First Five Now. Thank you for having me. And we hope you will please join us for our next First Five Now on Thursday, April 8th at 2 p.m. when we talk with Fiaz Rafiq, co-author of Muhammad Ali, My Brother, which profiles the heavyweight champion boxer and is co-written by Ali's brother, Rahman Ali. And for all information on Freedom Forum programs and initiatives, please visit us at freedomforum.org. Thank you for joining us for another edition of First Five Now.